Thank you. The only thing is that I find it a bit awkward to turn and look at her. We have no other option anyway. No, when I present my paper. I don't think there's any risk of it ringing. There's no no, no when I present my paper. That would be my, yeah, anyway, my, my one fear would yeah. be that it would ring. Yeah. So, so if you like, we can be in line and have to make sure nobody will call me here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't have any stress, so. Yeah. It needs to be there near the. Welcome to the second session. My name is Fred Denny. I'm uh, doing a little utility infielding here. And uh, although we're in the basketball season and it's quite crazy, as you've noticed, the March Madness. Uh, and I'm very uh, happy to be here and to introduce our speakers uh, for this session, which is on ethical decision making in local and international contexts. This is panel three originally, which we've moved to now because of one of our colleagues uh, having to get here a bit later uh, than we will do panel two this afternoon at 1.30, inshallah. Um, our um, <clears throat> moderator, uh, Dr. Birgit Kravitz from Tübingen, was unable to be here for this, and I'm, I'm very uh, pleased to have the opportunity to join you at this point with this very interesting panel. Our first uh, speaker is uh, Ms. Uh, Susie Krabiel from Brown University. Women do what they want, Islam and family planning in Tanzania. Um, Ms. Krabiel is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Cultural Anthropology at Brown University. Trained in anthropology and health sciences, she is currently finishing up her dissertation titled Marriage and Divorce, Localized Islam and Gendered Relationships in coastal Tanzania, Suzy Krabiel. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. This research considers family planning in Islam in Tanzania, and as you can see from the title of this talk, I particularly look at women's perspectives. There we go. Um, as an anthropologist, I will present my findings from an anthropological perspective, and this means that I will privilege the thoughts, practices, and beliefs of my informants over Islamic doctrine and mandates. Um, while I acknowledge the importance of Islam uh, and Islamic thought on these issues, I'm not questioning its stance. Rather, I'm attempting to understand how women and men in this context reconcile their cultural and religious beliefs with their more pressing pragmatic concerns. Uh, in this talk, I'll go over um, a few different things, the location and context, the research problem, my methodology, research questions and findings, and then um, if there's enough time, I will present some of the research from my, um, my PhD work. So the local setting, um, Tanzania is in East Africa, and the community in which I worked um, is located in the Northern Pari Mountains, which borders Kenya and is just south of Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, as you can see, it's a very rural community that uh, has um, an agricultural lifestyle uh, with few modern infrastructures. Uh, as you can see in this picture, this is the local clinic which provides very basic um, health services, um, including assisting women in births, uh, family planning and maternal, maternal and child health care. Uh, 
Today, sterilization is the world's most widespread form of birth control, but it is still extremely rare among Africans and Muslims. Less than 2% of family planning users in Tanzania use sterilization as a, their, their choice of birth control, and that is also true for Africa as a whole. Um, in the community that this research is based in, a survey indicates 33% of contraceptive users have had sterilization. And so this presents a very big question. Why are women choosing a method of contraception in a cultural context conventionally considered unreceptive to contraception in general, but sterilization more specifically? Um, and I should mention that Muslims and Christians comprise the community 50% each, and both are equally likely to um, use family planning and um, to, to have a sterilization. Uh, for my methodology, I spent four months um, in the community um, conducting ethnographic research. And what this means is that I spent my time doing in-depth interviews with women, men, nurses, religious leaders. Um, and I interviewed both Muslims and Christians. I interviewed both women who had used family planning and women who had not used family planning, and those who had had a sterilization and those who had not, because I really wanted to get at what are people's perceptions, what are their understandings, um, and how did they arrive at the decision that they made um, for, the, for their own selves. Um, questions included basic demographic details, fertility and family planning history, and an understanding of religious views of family planning. I also did participant observation. This means I spent my days participating in activities of daily living with women in the community. Um, I did what women did. I, the woman was going to the farm, I went to the farm and helped. If she was cooking, I was cooking with her. Uh, she was going to the market, so on and so forth. Um, this method reveals the multiple ways people interpret, adopt, and work within prescribed religious doctrine. It provides an interactive approach with a nuanced lens which goes beyond listing laws, norms, restrictions, and tells what people think and do. Oops. Um, research questions that were directing uh, this study included, uh, what are women's motives and explanations for the decision to seek a sterilization? How is sterilization ne negotiated in marital and family context and in light of wider community norms? Having been sterilized, are women satisfied with the decision and the outcome? What are individual perceptions of religious doctrine regarding family planning and how do these doctrines and individual and community interpretations of them influence reproductive decision making? Specifically, how do women and men manipulate, adopt, and construct their understanding of Islam and Islamic mandates regarding family planning to achieve their own goals. In this paper, I discuss three different women's cases and give detailed information on their life stories. Um, today, however, I will just summarize two of um, those case studies. Aina said, and she's the inspiration for the title of this paper, women do what they want, they decide what is best for themselves. And I have several quotes from, from her listed up here, but I'll read from the paper for a moment. Aina and I conferred about family planning and life in Uguena on several occasions. Several times she mentioned that Muslim women have a more difficult life than Christian women. With respect to Islam and family planning specifically, she noted differences between Christians and Muslims. The main difference was that the Lutheran Church actively encourages family planning for men and women, while the Sunni Muslim leaders and the Quran do not encourage women to use contraception. In fact, she said, Muslim leaders never talk about family planning. Aina speaks for her own Islamic religion and says, Husana. She notes that family planning is not allowed or permitted, quote, because they say it is God who gives you children, but you have to give them a good life. She said that Muslim women know that family planning is bad because they read it in the Quran. Many Muslim women, however, use family planning despite this knowledge. They just do not talk about it at the mosque. Aina explains, basically, women do what they want. They decide what is best for themselves. Clearly, there is a contradiction between religious doctrine and practices of women. Women have to make decisions about themselves and their families despite going against their religious leaders. Observing the difficulties of raising a large family and the benefits of family planning, she claimed, quote, our lives, they are hard. Now many Muslim women and men see how family planning and other things like development and education have helped the Christians. So now they too want to have less children and they want to take care of their children better so that they can have a better life. Family planning helps us with that. So many women use family planning anyway. 
even though Islam and the Quran say that we should not use family planning, end quote. The contradiction that many women use family planning and to have sterilizations despite knowing that Islam does not allow it is not a problem for Aina or other Muslim women in Ogueno. Rather, she sees that women are empowered by family planning to do what they want and need to do. For Muslim and Christian women alike, this often means using family planning and having a sterilization despite contradictory cultural, social, and religious messages. Mama Maharage never used family planning to space her children because she feared possible side effects from hormonal and barrier methods. She decided to have a sterilization because otherwise I would have 20 children instead of just nine. Sterilization also enabled her to end childbearing. Sterilization is the best method. You don't have to worry or think about it every day. You also don't have to worry about it not working. It is one time and then you are finished. It is permanent and you are free and have no problems. She interprets Islam to now quote, Wanaharusi Uzazi Wampango, permit allow us to use family planning. At this time, the leaders, they encourage family planning. They say that we should use family planning, that it is important, that we should decide for ourselves. In the past, they would say you are interfering with God's work. Now it is up to everyone to decide for themselves. Mama Maharage's case illustrates the anxiety women and men in Ugueno have about the side effects of hormonal contraceptives. Furthermore, sterilization is seen in a completely different realm than hormonal contraception. Mama Maharagi also discusses Islam and the Islamic leaders in Ugueno as being supportive and encouraging of family planning and contraception, very different from the views of Aina, thus revealing the multiplicity of views that exist locally regarding family planning and contraceptive use. Uh, while Islamists frequently portrayed as unambiguously opposed to family planning, and while many people assume that this stance translates into practice, my evidence from Ugueno challenges any straightforward connection between Islamic ideology and practice with regard to family planning in general and sterilization specifically. People can and do deny and manipulate cultural and religious norms for prescribing re reproductive behavior. An analysis of family planning and religion demonstrates how people actively adapt to and recreate their culture and religion. My research in Tanzania demonstrates that women, men, and religious leaders each interpret and understand Islam and family planning differently. The presence of these multiple ideologies allows women to make pragmatic choices on their own life circumstances without feeling that they are violating Islamic moral code. The ethnographic portraits and interviews presented in this article point to the ambiguity in, that exists within Ugueno regarding family planning and Islam. Sterilization, however, is the exception since Islamic doctrine prohibits this form of family planning. Yet, in Ugueno, Tanzania, we find many examples of Muslims undergoing the procedure. Aina put it best when she said, yes, many women, Muslim women use family planning. They just do not talk about it at the mosque. Basically, people do what they want. They decide for themselves. Neither women, men, nor Muslim leaders ever mentioned that sterilization was worse on a sliding scale of family planning methods prohibited by Islam. This research thus demonstrates that local people's perceptions of Islamic rules about family planning are inconsistent. Individuals are able to define their own approach by manipulating the rules or by resisting them. Research on reproduction and family planning, especially sterilization, has tended to consider African women in the context of family relations, where expectations about women's fertility are rigidly constructed. Similarly, Muslim women are portrayed as living in a context where Islamic religious prescriptions regulate behavior. This supposedly results in choices and ideals that are diametrically opposed to a modern paradigm of contraceptive use. Anthropological demographers have demonstrated, however, that women in Africa may have other agendas than those we impose on them when it comes to reproduction and family planning. Women in Ugueno contradict our expectations about rural Muslim African women and the acceptability of permanent contraception. Decisions of sterilization are embedded in women's narratives of their own health happiness, well-being, and freedom in terms of their family's health, happiness, and well-being, and in terms of achieving certain goals for their families. For many women, these goals justify the choice to use contraception, despite the stance they perceive Islam to have on their use of family planning. In Ugueno, the woman, couples, families, religious communities, and social communities are not homogenous units with uniform beliefs about family planning. What makes them different? What unites them? Aina and Mama Harage demonstrate that women and couples are working within a cultural system and a set of traditional traditions and norms to achieve their own life goals. 
All of these women have different life constraints and opportunities, yet each arrives at their own reproductive decisions and include conclusions based on what is best for her. Islam clearly plays a role in terms of how women, men, and couples navigate and negotiate their options. In Ugueno, religion matters, but religious doctrine may be less important than one might expect. Islam, despite its great variation internationally, nationally, and even locally, is often a domain of analysis that is presumed to unite groups of people. It is, however, clear that people interpret and manipulate their understandings of Islam in pragmatic ways, and the individual life situations lead to different decisions within the same ideology. Um, do I have another minute? On yes. This? Okay. Yes. Um, I just also wanted to quickly um, talk about uh, another case study because it was one of the comments made in the review of this paper that how does this relate to other places and other situations and um, my more recent research in Tanzania is on the coast um, south of Tonga um, among the Swahili which is um, all Muslim and um, I was looking at marriage and divorce practices and the gendered expectations of marriage in the context of historically high divorce rates and um, Obviously, what it means to be a Muslim and Islamic interpretation is extremely important um, in this context. And um, I wanted to just tell one quick story about uh, sterilization and uh, family planning in this context and um, this issue of cultural hybridity. And it was brought to my attention during uh, Ramadan in 2004 that women were using contraceptives, um, the pill, to skip their period during the month of Ramadan so that they could continue to fast. Um, for the whole month and not have to make it up later and um, this is totally counterintuitive to how family planning is presented in this context to women and it was so fascinating to me to see that you know that they had found out about this not from their health care providers but from a network of women who were talking about this and, and this seemed like a fabulous idea to them and they in fact did this for the first time um, and so anyway I just thought that was a <laughs> interesting anecdote to share. So thank you. We have one urgent question there, and then we will get to questions later, too. Just as a point of interest, um, the, the, the last use of, of contraceptives just as a point of interest, the last use of contraceptives is actually commonly used in Southeast Michigan um, uh, during Ramadan, as well as in Hajj. Yes, yes, um, in yes. fact, it's a service that we are that is offered, including by Dr. Asani, my wife, who's a gynecologist, uh, practicing in uh, at the Women's Health Center, University of Michigan. So, Great. and sir, just behind. Thanks for uh, your research. It says it was very interesting to me, at least. Um, but I have some problems with your research. Firstly, um, I, I don't know how it is right to present it as a Tanzanian view. You ha I think you have been to this, this town, starts with you. Is it representative to all Tanzania, first of all? I'm, I'm always suspicious, I'm mean, skeptical to all kinds of these um, qualitative research, including Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Bella's uh, talk in, in, in previous session. It doesn't represent at all to the T Tanzania, I guess. Secondly, um, I'm also skeptical how f um, familiar you are to the Tanzanian and Islamic culture. This may lead to some using some concepts uh, wrongly, I guess. For example, recreating religion. This is not something in Islamic understanding, you cannot recreate your religion. Uh, and also you said they, the women, thinks that uh, Islamic rules on, uh, on, uh, on contraception is uh, inappropriate or something like this uh, uh, in this time. Um, and uh, being a Muslim and uh, practicing Islam are different things. Uh, they do not think that they 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 do not feel that they are not violating Islamic moral code. They know that they are violating this, but they uh, uh, this is also another misconception I think uh, 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 due to a lack of the real uh, lack of the knowledge about the real philosophy of Islamic understanding. I guess I don't like to say. Okay. Well, um, first of all, I I don't presume to. Um, extrapolate this local study to all of Tanzania or to all of Islam. Um, and so that is very, um, if it wasn't clear in my presentation, I apologize, but it's very, I think, very clear in my paper 
that this is a local um, situation and I, and I don't make um, generalizations for all of Tanzania in, in the paper. Um, secondly, um, I'm not really trying to uh, say or contest or question what what it means to be a Muslim or what Islam has to say about these things. Um, I was really interested in the fact that this situation even exists in which not just Muslims but African women in you know a context of very high fertility rates that somebody um, would be willing to use this form of family planning and so I wanted to know and understand how these decisions were made and how they were negotiated and especially from I didn't go into this project intending to look at Muslim women specifically I went into this project wanting to understand how sterilization was being successful in this context and it appeared to me in that process that there were a significant number of Muslim women who were practicing sterilization and so I thought I need to ask questions about this and try to understand it more fully um, so that I could talk with other people about it once I left there and so um, I'm not sure if I've answered all of your questions but maybe we can talk more later but I hope that I'm starting to get at that yeah one more here um, I thank you for a really interesting paper and I, and I was just sort of thinking about your uh, analysis in relation to Shereen Hamdi's paper, mm -hmm. um, which is also a medical anthropologist, and the data is very rich, but uh, you know, I have some questions about some of the kind of analytical work that you did and, 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 and the way it contrasted to maybe some of the things that she was doing, because you sort of were presenting uh, Islamic doctrine as sort of these rules coming from on high, uh, whereas you know, she was kind of showing the contestation of Islam, the way, I mean, sort of based on, I guess, well, well, also the notion of debate. Is there a doctor? <laughs> 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 oh, okay, I guess not. Well, I'll, sorry, is this better? Okay. Oh, anyway, um, so is it working now? Oh, okay, great. Um, so, I mean, you, you know, you use language like uh, manipulating cultural and religious norms. I mean, this this sort of implies that Islam is kind of static, and then people are kind of or, or, or opposes like prag pragmatic needs and religious needs, as if those things can be sort of reified and separated. And you know, I think that that's maybe not um, the most analytically productive way to, to look at it, because I mean, in fact, maybe, and I'm just guessing, but it's possible that some of their oppositions to the imams' khutbas in the mosque uh, that could still be a religious-based logic, right? So they might be saying, you know, I mean, for the woman who said, you know, we do, women do what we want. I mean, there's verses in the Quran that talk about breastfeeding and, you know, women decide amongst yourselves in consultation. I mean, that kind of thing. So are they drawing on a religious logic uh, or is it really this, you know, uh, I mean, do you feel like the ethnographic data really does sort of show that they see Islam as this, you know, kind of imposition on their lives and then they have these sort of pragmatic needs on the ground? Well, I think it's both. Um, I don't think, I mean, I, I chose two different women who had actually differing views on this um, to just highlight how there isn't a consistent, a conformity, there isn't sort of an agreement on this. And um, I agree with everything you said. Um, I'm not sure if you've read the paper, but, um, but, but my, um, when I use those terms, the manipulated, I mean, it's really, um, I'm responding to sort of more of the demographic literature, um, the surveys in um, the Sudan or in Burkina Faso that look at um, Muslim women and sterilization and, and just sort of say, oh, it's not possible here because they're Muslim. End of story. And I'm trying to say, well, actually, I think it's, it's more than that. I don't think that it's because Islam has that kind of effect on their lives and that they interact with it in that way. And in the paper, I talk about how, in fact, I think that this situation was so unique and it had so much to do with the way that the services were for provided to women. Um, the doctor who came to this community and the nurses in this community, the way they discussed family planning, and it had more to do with um, how women were skeptical and nervous about hormonal methods of contraception that made sterilization seem so appealing to them because they didn't have the side effects that they identified with it. And so I think that's how, um, in this specific situation, it was um, possible and acceptable. Um, so was that a religious logic or was it? It's both. I mean, that's like, I, I feel really uncomfortable just sort of saying yes or no. I think for each woman, it was a very different interaction with her understanding and her. Um, 
in her life. Um, so, I, I mean, I could talk to you about all 40 women that I interviewed in each of their, their, the way they discussed it, but it was both. I mean, for some women, you know, they, they perceived that they were, this was totally um, something that they were now allowed to do. They saw a change. Um, they identified a change. Um, for some women, they said, no, it, it's still not allowed. And they were just saying, this is not practical for me. I can't have more children. Um, and so it, that was less of an, a religious response and more of a practical response. So there were both. Th th thank you, everyone. We need to move on because we have other papers. There will be opportunity for additional questions later. But I did want to uh, uh, have some of this because I think it sustains the vigor of the whole operation. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, our, our next uh, presenter is Dr. Abul Fadl Mohsin Ibrahim from KwaZulu University in Durban, South Africa. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Ibrahim is currently Professor of Islamic Studies in the School of Religion and Theology, University of KwaZulu Natal, Durban, South Africa. He is interested in Islamic law and bioethics and is the author of Birth Control, Surrogate pain, Parenting and Abortion, and Animal Experimentation, Cloning and Organ Transplantation. Uh, his paper for us today is Human Rights and Rights of the Unborn, Dr. Ibrahim. PowerPoint? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, what's, the what's the title of it? Yeah, the title. I don't do PowerPoint. <laughs> I, I'm Jurassic. <laughs> Maybe he does. To see this, the gray one on the, the right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm uh, glad to be here, and uh, I wish to thank the organizers of this conference for having actually uh, spent a lot of time in trying to prepare it, and I pray that it will be a successful conference, inshallah. Now, these two clauses pertain to, you know, this about the human, the right to life, right? Everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person, and then to change. So about the death penalty, so it means that you, you have the right, that human beings should have the right to life. When I come from South Africa, we find that the death penalty uh, is actually illegal. I mean, it's not enforced at all especially after President Mandela was released in 1994, and he made sure that this will never be, uh, I mean, the death penalty will never be imposed again in South Africa because it's against human rights. Now, this one is about the right to inhuman treatment. No one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. And therefore, from that follows the banning of corporal punishment. Even at schools today, we find that the teacher cannot even uh, hit the child. Now, as far as sanctity of life is concerned, we find that Islam upholds the sanctity of life, right? And what we want to, to what I really want to address in this paper is whether this injunction is applicable to the unborn, to the right to life of human beings in general can also be extended to the right to life of the unborn. Now, the status of the unborn, the crucial issue is, does the unborn have a serious claim to life? Is the unborn considered to be a person? The, as far as the perspective or prospective students, have, uh, parents are concerned, they refer to the unborn as their child with expectation that the new life would be a person to grow up with them. And they are contending viewpoints. If the unborn is a person, they would have equal claim to life as that of a person who is unconscious and is unable to do so. The unborn, another viewpoint is that the unborn is not a person since it cannot breed on its own, and hence it is no more than a complicated clump of organic material. 
And then the other view is the characteristic of the unborn makes it unique and distinguishable from a disease appendix or cyst or any kind of organic material. Now, as far as embryology is concerned, and we, in week six, the embryo is about a fifth of an inch in length. A primitive heart is beating, and head, mouth, mouth and liver, intestines begin to take shape. Week 10, the embryo is now about an inch in length. Facial features, limbs, hands, feet, fingers, and toes become apparent. The nervous system is responsive, and many of the internal organs begin to function. Now, this is interesting. Uh, Hadith or tradition of the Prophet, Ali Salaam, which I came across, is when forty-two nights have passed over the sperm drops, Allah sends an angel to it, who shapes it and makes its ears, eyes, skin, flesh, and bones. Then he says, "O oh Lord, is it a male or female?" And the Lord decides what he wishes, and the angel records it. Now the inference from that is that the unborn is a potential person. Now, from potential person to actual person, there's another tradition, of course, they have a difference of opinion among the scholars about this. Each of you is constituted in your mother's womb for 40 days as a drop of fluid, then it resembles something that clings to the womb for an equal period, then as a piece of flesh that has been chewed up for another equal period, then the angel is sent to breathe the soul into it. So after 120 days, the unborn passes, the stage of potential human being to actual human being, a real person. And Muslim scholars are unanimous in the sense that any aggression against it at that stage is punishable by law. Now, right to life, we find that in the tradition of the Prophet Islam, that many that the postponement for the death penalty on a pregnant woman is mandatory. That you cannot pass the death penalty on a, on any on a, on a pregnant woman. Uh, if she is uh, until and after the birth of the child takes place. So the School of Islamic Jurisprudence also tells us or agrees on, the, on, on this point that if life is detected within the belly of a dead pregnant woman, the unborn ought to be removed to cesarean section. Right to a healthy development, we find the concession given to a pregnant mother. And you know, during uh, pregnancy, then she doesn't have to fast if it's going to have an adverse effect on her health. Right to be born, then we find that the, these are the Sunni schools. I'm, I must mention it's not the, the Shia schools. I've omitted it here. It's the Sunni schools only, the four schools that are there. Abortion can be carried out without a valid reason. The Maliki school is permissible to induce abortion even during the first 40 days of pregnancy. The Shafi school abortion is a crime against an existing being. In the humble, humble is called blood money must be paid for hitting the belly of a pregnant woman and causing an abortion. And an, an exception, as far as the Roman Catholics are concerned, then uh, there's no distinction be, give, being given between the mother and the unborn. But as far as the Muslim Jewish are concerned, uh, while emphasizing the importance of life and potential life, they consider the health of the mother to be more important than that of the unborn, and we authorize abortion if the life of the mother is threatened by the impending pregnancy. Right not to be mutilated, and you know what happens when, when abortion takes place. It is a form of mutilation. It's killing the unborn, poisoning the unborn, and ripping it from the womb of its mother into pieces. Right to be buried is according to Islamic law. Uh, miscarried unborn or stillborn is to be buried. The unborn is born without, if the unborn is born without uttering a sound, ceremonial bath should be given, wrapped in the shroud, named and buried without the funeral prayer. At the conclusion, all schools of Islamic jurisprudence concur. Once fertilization has taken place, pregnancy ought to be allowed to complete its term. Aggression against the unborn is sinful when ensoulment has not taken place. Aggression against the unborn becomes a crime against a person when the unborn reaches the stage of its development whereby installment takes place. Ending the life of the unborn through abortion is ipso facto a form of mutilation. The unborn has the right to life, to a healthy development, to be born and to live as long as Allah permits and to be buried once it, its life comes to an end. Thank you. 
we do have some time for questions within <laughs> the professor's uh, period. Yes, right back here. Yes. Um, um, I, to paper, I was very interesting. Um, with regard to the references to Hadith that you mentioned, um, specifically um, the three equal periods of 40 days, this is a Sahih Hadith and then it's actually in the 40 Nawawi collection um, and would be considered of a value higher than perhaps some of the hadith that you mentioned and you didn't give the the uh, reference mm -hmm. to their collections. Um, and my understanding of this hadith in within the four schools is that um, as a legal uh, document, it would be able to uh, give precedence that uh, before the 120 days when the soul is the breathed in by Allah, that this would give an, uh, that first trimester a space, a legal space for that uh, first trimester abortion to be uh, legal by Islamic law. It's a, it's a, it's a valid opinion. So um, my, my um, question is, how are you, you know, presenting the 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 hadith uh, examples with respect to the legal schools? You're not delineating that clearly enough to to show, for instance, that the Hanafi school would would permit that with a reason. Yes. Uh, thank you for your question. Now, as far as the sources are concerned, I think it's in the paper. Well, she don't have uh, the paper. I mean, the references. It's in the paper. And uh, now, so far as your question pertaining to the difference of opinion, you see, even if it's a Sahih Hadith, the one that you talk about, 40 days, 40 days, 40 days, but uh, the Muslim, some Muslim scholars, they try to reason whether the Prophet Islam actually wanted to add to for to do an addition here 40 days 40 days 40 days, and be 120 days and that is why we find that the, the shafi school says from the very 40 days of pregnancy they were not allowed to, to disturb the pregnancy but now the scholars appreciate the hanafi school you know when they reason and they especially use the hadith which you have mentioned about 120 days and I think this makes sense because it, it gives a sort of legal, um, a legal precedent, if you want to call it, to have an abortion. But again, but again, we have to understand is that if all the schools of Islamic jurisprudence, they do not encourage ab uh, abortion. There must be a uh, uh, valid reason for that. So, life being after 120 days so that I mean that was the whole point of the definition yeah but the, uh, you still a potential human being you see that the pregnancy will result in the in the birth of not a monkey but actually a human being so we should respect human life from the very beginning of fertilization <coughs> yes thank you um, First of all, about the potentiality argument, we cannot treat people with their potentials. You have the potential to be the president of your country, but I do not treat you as you are the pre as, a, as an actual president now. Um, therefore, and secondly, I think it's time, the time has come and already passed to leave this expedient interpretation of these hadiths being 120 days. It's not meant 120 days there. It is not equal 40 days, but it's within this. Misla Zalik there means uh, uh, 40 days within this period. These things happen within this period. Because this, all this Nutfa, Mutha, Alaqa, Mutha has already finished within these 40 days. But this, is, uh, this interpretation says that. Um, uh, uh, by proud saying that Islam and Quran refers to embryological realities, uh, in day 80, for example, it should, uh, according to this hadith, it should 
look like to uh, 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 something which clings, which is not true. It's, it's just a full human person, in, um, uh, microscopically, uh, morphologically. Therefore, we should leave this interpretation. Uh, so this is not true that 120 days is, was meant in this hadith. It's meant 40 days, and we should add. Um, therefore, installment takes place day 50, uh, which is the beginning of eight weeks, as it is also mentioned in uh, modern embryology that then we can, well, then we become to call it as. Um, a zygo, em embryo, fetus rather than embryo, which is more relevant and more uh, uh, more um, uh, parallel to the current uh, current uh, modern embryology. Uh, therefore, and also, Islam is not a static religion; it's a flexible one. Therefore, you, we should not make it like Catholics do that the time uh, from from the, from the beginning from the conception onwards is, is prohibited. Then what we do with rapes and what are other reasons? And how can we leave these uh, a, a valid cause? Uh, so I think it's 50 days. And before that, it's, it is, uh, it is, macro, uh, it is uh, discouraged, macro, and after that, it is uh, sinful or forbidden. You have a good uh, uh, contribution here. But then I would like to also add that uh, you see, when you, you say that we shouldn't even talk about potential, potential to be a president is, doesn't, uh, doesn't, is, has nothing to do with my paper here. You can be a potential, but you're a potential human being from the moment you, you are, the fertilization takes place. I mean, there's no scientific basis that this pregnancy will not result in the birth of a human being. You must understand, this is how we should look at it in that context, and not in the context that you want to say that you're going to be a potential human being, uh, president of the United States or whatever. Then uh, the other thing uh, which you brought about is uh, the question of, you know, the, the, 40, uh, the stages of, of embryology that takes place. I think you should read uh, Professor Ali Alba's book on that, on, on on, on that, I mean, it, it's. Uh, I mean, of course, again, as you said, it doesn't mean that you have to take the hadith literally. And and uh, yeah. your other point that I want to really emphasize upon is that I'm not being dogmatic here in trying to say that uh, you know this is what the schools believe and so on. But actually, when there are exceptions, for example, rape and so on, then the Islamic law makes provisions for that for abortion, and I said an ex ex exception, and I mentioned one only, is about the health of the mother. So we can extend that. But what happens is that these very human rights that we have, these very human rights that we uphold, then these very people who uphold human rights, they have the violated human rights in many ways. So we don't want this to be in the sense of Islam, where the same problem happens. So we state the 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 position of Islam on abortion, and then we make exceptions when exceptions come. One more for now. Um, I think you, I enjoyed your talk, and you probably... <laughs> Turn on the mic. Um, <coughs> In any case, I enjoyed your talk. The, the two questions I have, I mean, every one of us, when we try to research, probably face the question you did. How to extrapolate um, from classical cases or from books of fatawa to, a, to a, maybe an unknown question at the time. So we all face this problem of trying to generalize a body of knowledge, which is not necessarily generalizable. And that's where my question lies. To represent Islamic uh, opinions as monolithic within your schools um, is a very, uh, crude way of doing it, um, because there is no monolithic opinions. For example, there's mashwar opinions, and there's other opinions as well. Um, so to present it as this is what this school says or that school says is, is kind of not giving it justice. And the other problem is that to say um, something is makru, as he mentioned the term, is disliked, doesn't mean it's sinful. In the Hanifi school, they have just two layers of makru, makru tanzihi, makru tahrimi. Um, so again, we must differentiate when we try to make a law or put a guideline out 
of what does the guideline mean in the Islamic paradigm of ethics, meaning is it going to lie in sin in the here and then in the hereafter is punishable or whether it's not. So these two things are very, you see what I'm saying, it's very crude to do it in such a manner without delineating each of these uh, things with respect to Islamic law. Um, and and the, those are basically my two points, that you, a crude understanding of, of a you know, school might have 15 different dissenting opinions on that specific thing, and yet might characterize it as makruh, or may characterize it as, characterize it as haram, which carry different connotations within the law. Can you, may I respond? I mean, um, <clears throat> I do understand what you're trying to lead to. And what I was trying to do is, um, what you have to understand is that um, you know, the, when you speak about the fatawa, all right, so if there is a categorical statement in the Quran, then there's no need for fatwa or fatwa, all right? If it's category state in the Quran. And my opinion is that if there's differences of opinion among scholars, then you as an individual Muslim can choose any of the opinion. So then you can practice it. So it's not a question of sinful because you're already following one of the, one of the uh, decisions of one school or one particular mufti, whatever he has said. So he has made a jihad and you follow it if you want, for example, organ, organ transplantation in India, especially perhaps in Pakistan also. Until recently, they, it was declared haram, but there are scholars all over the world that have uh, passed the fatwa that it is permissible. So now you as a Muslim, you must make up your mind where your conscience lies. If you feel that it, this fatwa is better, then it, so I don't think it will be sinful in the sense because the Quran is not categorical or the Hadith is not categorical about it. So you've, it's a process of ijtihad and the Prophet Islam says that if you, if you make ijtihad in strong, you still get a thawab for it, to be blessed for it. So now it's up to you as a Muslim to follow which, whichever opinion you think is best. Thank you very much. We must proceed with our final formal presentation and, and then we will have a little bit of time. Yes. Uh, I, I, I wonder if the speakers would, whenever they mention an Arabic word or a foreign word, they would just say the meaning in English. Mm -hmm. For example, there are so many words mentioned here, bad, fatawa, haram, halal, all these things, please, when you say the word, say it in English. So for, mm -hmm. for the sake of our colleagues here. Shukran, merci. <laughs> <laughs> our, 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 our third, uh, our third presenter is Dr. Thomas Eich from um, <coughs> Ruhr Universität uh, Bochum. Uh, he's on the faculty there. Dr. Eich is trained as a social historian of the 19th century Middle East, but has maintained a longstanding interest in bioethics. He is the author of, and I hope I can get this right, Islam und Bioethik, eine kritische Analyse der modernen Diskussion im islamischen Recht, published in 2005 by Reichert, and Dr. Eich will address the process of decision-making among contemporary Muslim religious scholars in the case of surplus embryos. Dr. Eich. Thank you very much. Maybe I just should translate this title of yes. the book into English yes. because maybe it's, it's um, uh, this is Islam and bioethics, a, a critical analysis of uh, modern discussions in, in Islamic law, because most probably many people don't know German. Um, uh, what I'm uh, doing at, at Bochum University since 2003 now is a research project uh, about uh, contemporary, about bioethics, about bioethical questions in the framework of Islamic law. So I will speak about Islamic law and Sharia particularly. Um, I do this by, by several in several ways. Uh, uh, one thing is I, I conduct a lot of interviews with uh, Islamic scholars. Until now, I've been to, to, to Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, and, and to Tunisia, to several countries up in several times. Um, and with those, uh, during these research trips, usually I discussed uh, the really contemporary issues such as cloning and, and uh, uh, stem cell research and stuff like that. Uh, when it comes to, to uh, things that are a little bit older, like what I will talk about today, uh, the example like of frozen embryos, and these were issues which were discussed when I was still going to school, so, so um, here I rely primarily on written materials. So the, the problem of frozen embryos, just 
to introduce this a little bit, um, is um, frozen embryos um, are brought about for several reasons um, during infertility treatments, IVF treatments, to produce more fertilized eggs than are needed for a single treatment, actually. Um, the ethical problem of what to do with these frozen embryos, which can be stored in, in the fridge, um, arises when they are not needed anymore for the purpose uh, for which they were created. Uh, it might be, for example, that a couple uh, who donated the oocyte and the sperm broke up or divorced or one of the partners or both of them died or it might also happen that an IVF treatment was successful and the couple does not want any additional children. Um, so from the beginning when this problem arose, there has always been the suggestion that it might be useful to, to use these embryos for research purposes because this way their inevitable destruction could serve some benefit at least, like this was the suggestion. And these issues were also discussed in the late 1980s and early 1990s by Muslim religious scholars, actually. In fall 1989, the Committee of Internationally Renowned Fokaha, religious scholars, and medical doctors um, at a meeting of the Islamic Organization of Medical Sciences, the IOMS, issued a recommendation, that's a tawsiya, uh, which stated explicitly that frozen embryos could be used for research purposes according to the Islamic law. Just half a year later, in spring 1990, an almost identical committee met at the annual meeting of the Islamic Fiqh Academy, the Majma al Fiqh al-Islami in Jeddah, the IFA, uh, which is attached or part of the Organization of Islamic Conferences. And they discussed the same issue again, um, relying on an almost identical body of expert studies. And this time, the scholars arrived at the opposite conclusion um, and issued a decree, an imprav, according to which the creation of frozen embryos should be avoided during IVF treatments. In case such embryos occurred, they should not be used for research purposes. So one is tempted to ask, like, how was such a fundamental change of opinion possible within such a short period of time, given that really we're almost the same people relying on an almost identical uh, set of expert studies? And I will show uh, that first, legal developments outside of countries of predominantly Muslim populations, and this is namely Germany, um, selective information and in a certain way, the manipulation of discussion processes at international meetings brought these two contradicting results about. Uh, I do not intend, definitely, I do not intend to argue that any of the three aspects which influence especially the legal statement of 1990 is a particularly Islamic phenomenon. Uh, on the contrary, it is my contention that Muslim legal experts are just human beings as many or any other human beings, and, and human beings are sometimes influenced by external influences, and this is just what happened here. The point is that in the 20th century, and particularly since the 1970s, Islamic law has witnessed the growth in number of international Sharia committees, uh, be it the Majma al Bukhud al Islamiyah, I won't translate it now, um, at Al Azhar, uh, the Islamic Fiqh Academy of the OSC, of the Muslim World League of India, or, for example, the uh, IOMS. And these institutions or organizations. Uh, were created in order to, to promote group ijtihad, the independent reasoning. Uh, in other words, the legal statements of these committees are not an expression of one single scholarly mind anymore, but they are the result of negotiations between several scholars. And therefore, techniques of directing discussions, which are known to many or maybe all of us, uh, from parliamentary sessions or especially, for example, from faculty meetings, um, have entered the decision-making process at these committees. And this is what I will try to show. Um, I, I will skip this. I will not go into much detail here. Um, it's just important to note that there was a prelude to all this in 1987 um, at a meeting of the IOMS, which is based in Kuwait, um, uh, during which, for the first time, uh, this question of the surplus or the frozen embryos um, was discussed. Uh, it was not discussed in much detail, but, but anyways, uh, at the end, um, uh, the final recommendation uh, formulated a compromise between the two opposing camps, which uh, already materialized at this uh, meeting, which uh, one side said 
uh, one opposed the, the uh, scientific use or the use for scientific research of embryos, and the other ones supported it. Um, so it was stated in this uh, final recommendations uh, that on the one hand, uh, researchers were encouraged to develop techniques to store sperm and eggs separately in order to avoid the whole ethical issue generally. On the other hand, it allowed three options how to deal with those frozen embryos in case uh, they were created. And these three options were to let die, to kill, and to use for science. And in 1987, uh, it was added that the first, to let die, uh, was would be the best of three bad options. Uh, so when in 1989 uh, the scholars met again um, in order to discuss uh, this uh, in more detail, uh, there were uh, at, there were three um, expert papers presented by uh, religious scholars. Uh, in 1987, there had been no expert papers by, by religious scholars, only two papers which were presented by medical doctors. Um, I will just talk about two because the third by, by the Jordanian uh, Omar Lashbar is not very interesting because he just summed up uh, the 1987 uh, recommendation. Uh, so one paper argued for and the other argued against uh, research on embryos. Um, uh, Abdul Salam al uh, and both were Jordanians. Uh, Abdul Salam al uh, who argued for no, he argued against um, the, the uh, use for scientific research. Um, first, he defined abortion as as the ejecting uh, of the embryo from the female body, no matter uh, if this happened before or after nidation. And because he defined it like this, he could treat um, the, the use of aborted embryos as well as the use of extracorporeal embryos, the frozen embryos, in, in one study. Um, and he, he considered first the use of aborted embryos for research purposes as unproblematic because the embryo would already be dead um, under the condition, of course, that the abortion had not been initiated for research purposes. And concerning the question of frozen embryos, he argued that the majority of the classical Fopaha would have opposed abortion and therefore um, the use of frozen embryos for research could not be allowed and the embryos should be implanted into the mother's uterus. Um, he did not address the issue, for example, what should happen if the mother died or something like this. So this was his study, which, which argued against uh, the use of embryos. Uh, Muhammad Naim Yassin argued the other way around. Uh, he argued that life would exist, and now we come again to this uh, 120th day. Uh, he, he argued that life would exist since the fertilization of the egg, but only through uh, ensoulment at this 120th day would it become human life. Like this is the important distinction which uh, was brought up in, in the 1980s. Um, this would not imply that abortion before ensoulment could be allowed easily because, according to Yassin, uh, the classical Fokbaha uh, did not link their rulings which forbade abortion to ensoulment, but based it on the embryo's potential to develop into a human being. So for him, the basic question, and this is typically uh, Sharia reasoning, um, the basic uh, question would be uh, whether the expected benefit would outweigh the expected damage. Um, and on all this, there would be two parties, according to Yassin, um, who would experience damage by the destruction of these extracorporeal embryos, the parents and the embryo. And according to him, um, if the parents uh, would consent to this procedure, they would not suffer any damage because uh, the realization of their wish to have children would not constitute an absolute necessity in the Sharia. Concerning the embryo, uh, the basic argument would be his potential to grow into a human being once it would be implanted into a uterus. However, and now this is the important point, because here he agrees with, with uh, our body, uh, now he differs because um, the, he says there would be cases in which such an implantation could not be recommended for medical reasons, first. And second, uh, there would be cases in which it could not be allowed according to the Sharia because any form of in vitro fertilization implying procreation outside of the framework of an existing legal marriage would be forbidden. And therefore, uh, the embryo could not be implanted after divorce or if the donor of the oocyte or the sperm had died. In other words, um, those embryos would suffer no legal harm, this is important, would suffer no legal harm by the destruction because according to the Sharia, they could not have developed legally into a human being anyways. Like this is 
his argument. And during the discussion at this meeting in 1989 at the IOMS, religious scholars like Yusuf Al-Qaradawi and Osman Shubeya from uh, Jordan supported Yassin's view. And at the end of this, this meeting in 1989, uh, the following sentences were added to the recommendations of the 1987 meeting, like they just added a sentence. Um, and I quote this, um, according to the opinion of the majority with which some disagree, uh, that the destruction of the fertilized egg before the invasion in the uterus is allowed, no matter how this destruction is brought about. According to this opinion, there is no reason to forbid scientific experiments in accordance with the Sharia. During these experiments, the egg cells must not be multiplied. Some disagreed entirely with this view. So this was uh, fall 1989. Um, and this is clear, uh, clearly stating that, that uh, the majority of the Muslim scholars there um, agreed uh, that, that uh, surplus or uh, frozen embryos can be used for uh, research purposes. Just half a year later, the, the IFA, as I said, uh, in, in uh, March 1990, uh, organized a similar meeting. Um, and it's very interesting to, to uh, the IFA uh, as well as the, the IOMS, they both usually publish the proceedings of these, these uh, meetings, uh, which is a difference to, or it's a stark contrast to uh, other organizations. Um, and in these proceedings, usually uh, you have the expert studies which were presented or supposed to have been presented at these uh, meetings, as well as the transcripts of the public debates, which uh, ensued afterwards. Um, so at the IFA meetings, um, the expert studies are usually also uh, included in these proceedings. And um, if you compare the proceedings which were supposedly uh, presented at this IFA meeting in 1990, uh, you will find that um, uh, there are almost the same studies which had been presented have you before at the IOMS meeting. But when you go into uh, the transcripts of the discussion, uh, you will find uh, that these studies were not presented at this meeting. Um, they were not at hand at all, obviously, and they were therefore not discussed at this meeting. Um, it also becomes clear from these uh, transcripts that several, or at least one author, namely uh, Mohammed Naim Yassin, was not present at this conference, and therefore, of course, he could not argue his point. Um, the discussions and transcripts uh, show that uh, the deputy head of the IOMS, Ahmed Ragai Gendi from, from Egypt, uh, gave a short presentation um, about the IOMS meeting, or what had happened just half a year before at this IOMS meeting uh, in fall of 1989. Uh, in his, uh, and he gave a summary of the three uh, studies of these uh, religious scholars. Um, and in, in this summary, he devoted most time to Ibadi's study, which, as I said, opposed uh, the use of embryos for scientific research. In the transcripts, that's 16 lines. Um, then came the study of Ashpa, 10 lines, which also opposed the uh, uh, scientific uh, research on, on, on embryos. And finally, uh, he presented the study of Yassin uh, in just four lines. Uh, therefore, I would say um, the studies which had opposed the scientific use of embryos were given much more space than the study allowing it. And I will not quote that now, but, but uh, from the wording that uh, again he chose, uh, you can also say that at least um, he presented Yassin's study in a quite abridged manner. Uh, the following discussion then followed the pattern of reading and then discussing each paragraph of the IOMS recommendations from 1987 and 1989. Uh, when it came to the paragraph allowing embryo research under certain conditions which had been added in 1989, uh, Bakr bin Abdullah Abu the head of the IFA and chair of the panel, intervened immediately by referring the discussion of this paragraph to the non-public committee um, of the IFA, which would eventually formulate the final decree to be published at the end of the meeting. And there are also indications, which is not very surprising, that, uh, 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 of course, this, this uh, statement had been, this final decree had, had already been drafted before uh, the meeting. Um, from the transcripts, and this is maybe the most interesting part, from, from the transcripts, it also evinces uh, that the passing of the embryo protection law in Germany had a decisive impact on the discussion among the Fokaha. According to this law, the creation of frozen embryos during IVF treatments has to be avoided and it's a, a hotly contested law, by the way, in, in Germany. Um, 
Um, and Ahmed al Ghail again we, uh, referred or, or he, he uh, uh, pointed out that there were certain new te techniques uh, which would allow the creation of the exact number of embryos needed for a successful IVF treatment at that time. So what he probably had in mind was a technique um, of freezing the oocyte after the sperm had entered it, but before the two nuclei had merged, actually. This was a technique which was used in Germany for a certain short period of time um, in, in the early 1990s, which is not used anymore right now, because it has a much lower success rate than freezing the fertilized egg, like success of uh, leading to, 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 to pregnancy. And this is, I think, an important point since it has to be kept in mind in all these discussions that frozen embryos are created in the first instance in order to lower the negative physical and psychological uh, consequences for women receiving an IVF treatment. Um, the whole ethical and legal discussion about frozen embryos only starts once they are not needed anymore to achieve pregnancy, the purpose they had been originally created for. Uh, so I guess that uh, should be kept in mind. Uh, so eventually, um, uh, at the end of this conference, um, uh, uh, there was this decree, a decree which I just mentioned, and I will just quote this. Uh, this decree said, first, in view of what has become reality concerning the possibility to store non-fertilized oocytes for later use, it is necessary to restrict the number of fertilized eggs to the number necessary for a single treatment in order to avoid a surplus of fertilized eggs. Second, if for any reason such a surplus of fertilized eggs is brought about, they are supposed to be left without medical help so that the life of the surplus may end in a natural way. So this is exactly the opposite of what they had been agreed on uh, half a year before. Um, I think uh, what is most interesting in this is uh, the role, as I mentioned, of the passing of the embryo protection law in Germany in 1989-1990, which also um, has to be viewed against a very, very particular historical background in German history. Um, just in uh, the, uh, the re reunification was just on its way then. Uh, the interesting point is that the passing of this law allowed a rhetorics at the 1990 IFA meeting, uh, look how Islamic Germans are, let's just catch up with them. Like, this is really, you can even sense it from the transcript. Um, and I, I guess this is most probably not an isolated example, uh, example in bioethical dis discussions where a Sharia statement uh, was decisively influenced by law-giving processes in a so-called Western country uh, because the technologies and the debates accompanying these technologies or the introduction of these technologies are getting more and more globalized. Um, accordingly, it seems reasonable to assume, to me at least, that uh, political or legal statements shaped by the Sharia and the ulama are more and more becoming part of this global bioethical discourse as is evidenced, for example, uh, by the decisive role of the Organization of Islamic Conferences during the UN negotiations about a worldwide ban of human cloning. Thank you very much. First questions um, addressed to Dr. Ike. He hasn't had the chance to. Uh, right here, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, actually, um, if we look at the uh, uh, two religious caste opinions, you said that one to allow it and then a few years later negated it. Is that correct? In 89. Uh, the reason for that is that because the involvement of cloning, because as you know, in 1997, the cloning of Dolly. So that's the actual reason for, uh, in, in Jeddah, at that time, they casted this opinion regarding the, the, the uh, to stop the whole research on embryo research. Uh, in fact, uh, about two, uh, two and a half years ago, uh, Saudi Arabia has uh, uh, provided, actually, us with the royal decree for the um, rules and regulation with regards to IVF units and centers. And it does not, necessarily say that you should not attempt, in fact, uh, embryo research, as long as this research is a for a PGD program, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis program, uh, and as an analytical rather than a therapeutic use. 
Uh, that's one thing. And second, not to attempt, of course, any cloning of any kind. And the third is that should be supervised by a medical ethics and a committee for research. So uh, the embryo research is very, very you know, restricted to uh, um, anal analytical rather than therapeutic use or to be indulged in the uh, muddy water of this cloning. So that is as far as, and also in Bahrain now, uh, we are revising and hopefully will uh, uh, produce this uh, the similar kind of um, policies and procedure which will be coming, be coming soon. So this is with regards to that. And the second is that probably the reasoning, as I said, here in Islam there is called Sadda Daraya, which is to block any kind of uh, unforeseen reasoning. You don't know what's happening, so it might as well stop it and then think of it. So it's really not to forbid, but to keep on hold because of the cloning business until it is sorted out. Thank you. Right over here. Uh, yes. Yeah, actually, when you were uh, Michael Gordon from Toronto, Baycrest Center and the Joint Center for Bioethics, University of Toronto. Um, when you were talking about the, the change, it reminded me of a very old classical rabbinical tale where the three men approach the rabbi and ask for his opinion. The first one makes a statement, he just says, you're right. The second one makes a statement, he says, you're right. The third one says, how can they both be right? He said, you're right too. <laughs> I think it's a reflection on the human condition that whatever, whether it's religion or whatever, we, we change according to many factors, the human condition being that. But I have a question in terms of this decision-making process with the use of embryos, and it comes up within, you know, halacha as well in Judaism. But with the overriding importance of sanctity of life, the question would be, what if that embryo actually could be used, could be used beneficially, not so much in research for which we're not sure what the outcome protocol might be, but for direct benefit in the saving of a life. Would that change the equation within Islamic the, the discourse as to whether these extra embryos, which could be beneficial to an individual's well-being, could then be used for that? Well, basically, um What's interesting about these these uh, discussions I, I just referred to is that they were both conducted in the framework of a conference about uh, organ transplantation, actually. Um, and this is exactly what was brought up. Like 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 this is um, so for certain scholars. Uh, to my experience with with, with these sources, um, and I could name them because. For Yassin, for example, uh, um, it's, it's very clear that, that in such a case uh, he would allow it because uh, the benefit would outweigh the the, uh, uh, the harm, the damage. Um, for others um, who would would uh, argue from from this this uh, Homa rights, these bodily integrity rights from from uh, fertilization, uh, which is very strongly. Uh, argued, for example, by Malikite scholars, uh, especially uh, Muhammad al Muhtar Salami from Tunisia, who is very prominent in, in these discussions, um, always makes this point again. Uh, so he would not allow it. So this is all I could say about that. Dr. Bella. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, okay. Next. Thank you for this very interesting presentation. I was struck by the fact that all over the world, in Islam and Christian thought and Jewish circles and secular ones, we're all dealing with this problem. How do you deal with this very new entity, right? Embryos that are in a lab that are not in a woman's body. And, you know, how do we think about this very new challenge? And I'm struck by how one moves from a discourse that's out there already about abortion to this very new problem. And it seems to me that if one moves too quickly from the one to the other, then one erases the issue of location, the location being within a woman's body. Um, so that, for example, it might be quite possible to be extremely liberal about abortion. And now I'm thinking of your earlier paper and some of the questions. One might be concerned about issues of women's health if one is too strict on the abortion issue. But that is really not particularly relevant 
when embryos are frozen in laboratories. So if one skips too quickly over location, to put that almost um, amusingly, but not so amusingly, if one skips too quickly over the meaning for women's lives of when an embryo is inside their body and one is making a decision versus embryos in the lab extracorporeally, um, it seems to me one loses rather a lot. And I'm interested in how the discussion between these two um, opposing viewpoints that you talked about took into account the difference between ascribing certain um, status and appropriate responses to embryos within women, within women's bodies and embryos in labs. Thank you. Maybe just because uh, it just occurred to me right now, I just should, should uh, insist once again. Um, what I was talking about is really a discussion in Islamic law. Like, like this is very important. Like, I, I would not say this is Islamic or something. This is like a discussion among Muslim religious scholars. Um, the point I'm trying to make, or, or what I'm learning more and more when I read this, you find almost all the same arguments all over the world. Like, like uh, what these Muslim scholars say is not so different from what, for example, uh, the debate uh, is about in Germany. Um, um, so, so, for example, uh, this, this issue of uh, can the destruction of an extracorporeal embryo be uh, subsumed under abortion, yes or no, um, this discussion is there uh, among the religious scholars as well. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that it depends very much on, in these group discussions, on how certain scholars um, are able to take control of the discussion or to put it some, somewhat differently to, to, to shape the discussion so that their arguments are finally in, in, in the, the, the final text of a recommendation or uh, an aircraft. Um, and once again, I, I wouldn't say that this is once again uh, typically Islamic or something or particularly Islamic, this is just normal. Um, and so you have the same discussions, as I said, uh, all of the plays. And I would say that in my impression, um, because we are working in a uh, transdisciplinary uh, bioethical research group uh, at, at, at Bochum University, um, uh, several of my colleagues already suggested that, that you could draw a line not so much between the religions or the regions or whatever, but between different approaches, uh, uh, maybe more consequentialist approaches, more utilitarian um, approaches, and so on. Uh, and therefore, as I said, um, uh, you can find uh, the same arguments in, in, the, in these debates as you can find them in Japan, for example, as I know from a colleague. Dr. Bella. Thank you. It's just a little comment, actually. I, uh, I do not find the difference or contrast between the fatwas, that's the religious opinions, as unusual or even confusing. Uh, the Quran, which is a book of science rather than a book of science, uh, uh, the Quran is a quantum. Quantum, for Arabic speaking here, is Hamalu Auju. Hamalu Auju. It carries post probabilities. It carries probabilities, and uh, you know, in which the the observer <coughs> decides the outcome. And uh, Islam itself is built on three integrated principles: Sharia, which is the Islamic law; faith, which is a belief in the law; and ethics, which is performance or behavior. Thank you, Dr. Moazam. Um, Doctor, I. I thoroughly enjoyed your paper. I think it's, it's a superb um, study that you have done. I'll make just two points. Um, the first thing is that I think papers like this are important because the first thing that they bring to the audience is the fact that people who are Muslims and are living in that part of the world are very much aware of what is going on in this part of the world. However, that is not the opposite is not true so i think your paper really makes makes that brings home that point uh, that uh, this part of the world needs to be a little more aware that there's a great deal that's going on there 
The main uh, point I'd like to make is just as a follow-up on what you've presented, which you may wish to look at. In February this year, um, IOMS had, again, a very large meeting in Cairo, and the theme of that was genetic engineering and reproductive technology. Um, during that meeting, and I was there, they had asked me to present on something, this particular issue came up again. And what I find fascinating is that it was stated by several people, including Dr. El Gendi, who organized this again, that at this point um, there is unanimity, and the uh, FICA Academy was also mentioned, that where surplus embryos are concerned, um, it is okay to do, it is uh, permissible to do um, uh, research, uh, including for stem cell. However, what is prohibited is essentially um, to produce embryos just for the, for the sake of research. So I find it fascinating based on what you have talked about these two positions. In this particular, just two months ago, it, it was presented as though there is now unanimity on this uh, amongst the Muslim ulama and fuqaha. Thank you. Right over here. Um, back. Yes, okay, and then there. Hello? <laughs> okay. Um, I just wanted to know, has there been a change in the opinion or any sort of dissenting opinion since 1989, 1990, and the 16 years that have gone by since then? Uh, has a similar type of, well, other than that, in, in between there, between 2005 and 1990, has there been anything else uh, that went on that kind of contrasted these opinions or a similar sort of thing? Uh, yes or no, like, like this is just what, what, what also uh, Dr. Eskandrani said, like referred to the cloning incident in 1997, uh, which caused a huge debate again. Um, apart from that, I'm not aware from, uh, from, from, from my work that there was much discussion because, well, these, these, uh, especially the IFA discusses a lot of things, not only medical issues. So, so basically, apart from what was said by the others, no. Um, Salam alaikum. This is Othman Chibli from University of Buffalo, New York. My, um, I have one comment on this uh, that's applied to all the presenters today and this morning, which is, um, I mean, in Islam, we have different kind of opinions that evolve uh, through history. The reason it is from day one in Islamic uh, scholastic studies and Islamic law, there was two school of thoughts. One is the school of text. Um, like which is abide 110 percent by what the text says whether it is quran or hadith and the other school of thoughts from day one was from even the sahaba the prophet muhammad companions is the school of thought of reasoning what is the aim and intention of the text and that's why we see different uh, opinion uh, f for this reason it will be sometimes i feel disturbed when they say this is the islamic op uh, this is the islamic thoughts I think it is Islamic opinion. One of Islamic opinion could be this way and another Islamic opinion. So there is no per se one view. And even historically, uh, one of the Muslim caliph, he tried to, he ordered the uh, Imam Malik to make one school of thought, to make everybody agree. He refused. In fact, this is the richness of Islamic civilization. Based on this, what I want to say that uh, from a human rights perspective, uh, al shatibi for example, said, um, that uh, in his book al muwafaqat Goals of Sharia, that there is human rights and God rights. And then when they come into conflict, the human rights supersede God rights because human rights are based on limited wealth, power, while God rights are based on unlimited wealth, power, and forgiveness. For that reason, then the text, general text of Quran that talks about like world issue of peace and uh, universal justice supersedes sometimes particular text or, or hadith in the Quran. 
when they come into conflict. So just I wanted to sh share with you that we cannot say Islam is this. We should probably use the word Islamic opinion on this issue could be this and another Islamic opinion could be that. Thank you. Thank you for this Rahmah of a final comment. Uh, and uh, Jonathan, do you have anything? Uh, one, more. one more. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Shabir Alibi from the University of Toronto. Uh, my question is to Susie Cravio. I presume that it's open to any of the speakers. Is that correct, yes. moderator? Yes. Um, the, I had a concern or a question based on your presentation about the notion of the Islamic perspective on on, for, on sterilization. In your talk, you were careful at times to talk about how you were presenting the opinions of the women who you had interviewed, the 40-odd women or so. Yet at other times during the paper, as well as your presentation, you spoke about the actual Islamic position on sterilization as, in fact, if I understood correctly, you were presenting from your understanding or your analysis or whoever you had spoken with that, in fact, Islam is against sterilization. And I, I'd appreciate if you could clarify that were you presenting the views as you understood them from the women you interviewed or from different sources? Because that's not the Islamic position from a number of scholars in, in different schools of thought with respect to sterilization, at least in the last sort of 10 years in which there has been changes. So I would appreciate your commentary on that to make sure there's no confusion uh, in the audience. Thank you. Sure. Um, well, mostly it's the opinion of the people that I spoke with, but in the paper I do talk about um, what other anthropologists and demographers, their understanding of um, what what Islamic opinion is on um, the topic. And I actually, if there are more of you who um, have greater understanding, I would love to talk more about it because my area of expertise isn't Islam. and. Um, I've garnered whatever information that I can about this from from family planning and um, and other sources uh, on the topic. So um, I don't ever intend to sort of imply that there is a unified monolithic understanding or opinion about it. So um, I would love to talk more about it, though. Thank you, Jonathan. Do you have any uh, announcements or anything that need to be made? Because we are a little over our time now and. Uh, we have another session at 1.30. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. So let me just first uh, thank you, Fred, and thank the panelists for a terrific uh, panel today. Thank you, everyone. If you have any questions about uh, lunch arrangements,